Welcome to the 15th anniversary show in the Ashby Hodge Gallery of American Art. This portion is The Art of the Playbill, 100 Years on Broadway. Your tour guide is John Kelly, a former professor at Central Methodist, who is now at Elmira College in New York. Uh, we begin with the original Playbill, actually the year before Playbill began, and then move to the original Playbill, the earliest known existing Playbill now, 1885, with both the exterior and interior, which included some sepia-printed materials, including advertising and scenes from the play. We also include then some works from the Madison Square Theater, the same theater, as it develops to a simple line art, to a more elaborate line art, and then early in the 20th century into color lithography. And that then is surrounded by a number of bills, both broadsides and programs, some in paper, some in silk, and then a variety of other line drawings from the early 20th century and the very, very late 19th century. If we move a little bit further, we go into the early 19-teens to early 1920s, somewhere in that time period, and we have a good number of original created art that includes work by some artists that we are familiar with. Uh, we have Maxfield Parrish, we have works by Archie Gunn, we have some works uh, unattributed by other artists that, that we have names for but nothing else, and a variety of different works. Uh, F. Earl Christie is, is one of the featured artists, and these works develop the interest in color covers early in the 20th century right to just before the Great Depression. If we move further, then we move into art inside the playbill. Most of the art that we're looking at are, is cover art, but we are looking at some art created specifically for playbill by leading artists of the day that was intended to be an addition to the playbill. So people would keep them as souvenirs, and they just happened to keep all that lovely advertising at the same time, too. So we have program girls, artworks created weekly by a variety of artists from 19 middle teens to 1922, by noted artists. F. Earl Christie did a good number of works that are displayed. Malcolm Strauss has a number of works that are displayed. Strauss's work actually moves into advertising and goes beyond that. We also have a Brinkley Girl. We also have work by John Burke and a variety of other artists. So there is a good variety of, of works within the Program Girl. The Program Girl was actually also sold as artwork. So these initial designs were sold at this size as printed artworks to go into the home. Those became popular and then were enlarged to become large wall hangings also for the home or, or office. And uh, those seem to have disappeared, so we don't have any of those. But we can move a little further. As we move further, we get into the 1930s to the 1940s. And a great deal of the art from the 1930s and the 1940s was uh, already existing. It was extant art. There, there were artworks that producers or theater owners particularly liked and would put on the front of their programs related specifically to the theater itself, not to the production that one saw within the theater. The artworks often were borrowed from the New York Public Library, the Steed Collection. Some were borrowed from individual collections. Some were borrowed from the Library of Congress. And occasionally, they would literally just copy a variety of different artworks printed from a variety of sources. We have uh, three of the originals from John Tallison Company, a uh, London and New York publisher, that printed actors in Shakespeare in plays, uh, 1850 to about 1855, something like that. And a number of these were copied onto the copies of the playbills. But the playbills seem odd because these very dramatic pieces will have musical comedies within them. And, and we see a variety of different covers. The covers uh, range from complete works of art to single characters within complete works of art. Some are related to the names of the actors for whom the theater were named, the Forest Theater the Mansfield Theater, others related to the actresses playing leading roles. So we have uh, Victoria Regina in 1936 with Helen Hayes, and we have Canada with uh, Catherine Cornell. And a variety of these works come about also. If we go a little bit further, we will move into the 40s and into the 50s, and the artwork develops accordingly. We do find that artwork now begins to be 
related to the production rather than the theater itself. And as we do that, we find initially the artwork looks like the 30s, but beginning in the late 40s and moving into the 50s, we really have artwork that is unique to its own period. So the 30s start us out with Amphitryon 38, Whittle Gordon's piece. We move into the 40s with Streetcar Named Desire by Don Freeman and have a variety of other Freeman works within that. The, the truly unique period in terms of appearance is in the 1950s. The 1950s brings an entirely new style of, of artwork that is very simple, in a lot of ways cartoon art, but still very effective art. And a great number of artists that uh, are noted for other work grace the covers of Playbill. The uh, Good as Gold Playbill is by Bill Malden, a very, very famous World War II artist. Uh, Strahlhut, John Philip Strahlhut, uh, does work in Pal Joey. A number of recognized artists, Peter Arno, etc., all work in the 1950s, creating very simple but very effective artwork. And we see that going around as we, as we move. The 60s were a horrible period of art, so we don't have much of anything there. We skipped the 60s until very late in the 60s, in 1969 was 1776, and move rather into the 1970s. A great deal of original art worked in the 1970s, and Frederick Marvin has a great number of pieces, and Hilary Knight also has a great number of pieces. Now, most people don't know Hilary Knight in theater, but if they know the Eloise character, the Eloise character was created by Hilary Knight. So a great number of Hilary Knight's works were there. Some of the pieces are particularly evocative. Some of them were actually not artworks created by pencil, but in uh, needlepoint for Shenandoah. Uh, some are created by unique artist Clovis, does the cover for Old Calcutta. But they all combine to create a really interesting and truly moving period of new and evocative art in theater. As we move a little bit later, the 70s continue. Dream Girls moving into the 80s with Big River and some of the other time period. And we begin to see a good number of playbills in color. Most productions liked to begin their playbills in color because they were suggestions of quality of a show that was going to be a major hit. Unfortunately, color costs producers money. Black and white playbills are produced and provided for the, to the theater for free. Color playbills have to be paid for by the producing organization, and that's a wonderful attraction as long as your pr production is making lots of money. If, however, for some reason, you're not quite selling as many tickets as you might, we go to black and white. So, for example, rent in color is rather unique uh, because it only lasted a little while before they started moving to black and white because it was cheaper to do that. Some productions never quite made it to color. Is He Dead from last season was almost always in black and white, and you really don't see much, much color. The, uh, the relatively modern pieces are uh, a variety of different designs. Some are created by media conglomerates, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, City of Angels, and, and those are rather hard to determine in terms of who specifically did those. But some of the other works, especially the works by James McMullen, of which we have at least five here, are really uh, unique artworks, and McMullen is probably the greatest of the artists currently working today in the theater, and continues to do so. A little further on is artwork created by theater artists. So the covers are work by people who most often, although not always, were associated with the production. The Selwyn Theater cover actually was uh, by an artist who worked in one Selwyn production, and then that cover existed for a number of years. <coughs> The uh, Ballyhoo of 1932 is a Russell Patterson. Russell Patterson was very, very noted during his time and has sort of disappeared. The playbills for Hamlet and for High Tour are both by Joe Mielsen, or probably the dean of theatrical scenic designers, and he sometimes did the entire production, not just the designs. Oliver Smith gave us Rosalinda, a Strauss operetta that was made into a theater piece, rather unsuccessful. Tony Walton gives us Romanoff and Juliet. Edward Gorey gives us Dracula. And I do have a piece by Cecil Beaton of uh, Ray Bolger. But surprisingly, Cecil Beaton had nothing to do with the production. Ray Bolger liked that artwork and used it in a number of his covers. The greatest of the cover artists, and I think that's undisputed, 
is a man called Hirschfeld, or Al Hirschfeld, who began designing covers for the theater in the late 1930s after having moved to New York to study art as a student. Uh, his artwork was discovered while he was doodling, literally doodling one day at, in the midst of a show. That work was taken to the New York Tribune, and from that time on he became a paid artist, or I guess a professional artist at that point, and worked uh, until his death uh, 60 odd years later, and created such works as Swing in the Dream, Kismet, The Golden Apple. Uh, my earliest recollection was Man of La Mancha in the mid 60s, mm -hmm. but certainly he goes right up into this current century. Uh, my favorite of the works is Noises Off, perhaps the ultimate theatrical cover of theater people doing what they should do, going to the theater. So it's a, it's a wonderful cover. As we got into the current works, you notice that the playbills begin to have a banner that is always yellow. The, the yellow banner has now become uh, the expected cover for playbill. That's not always been the case. In the 1950s, 1957, 1958, Playbill experimented with a different series of colors. There were some blue covers, light blue covers. There were some green covers. There were some red covers. And the covers made little difference to the saleability of the Playbill. So Playbill decided on yellow as their banner color. Not because yellow sold any better, but yellow was the cheapest color to print. And we went with that rather than other colors. Today we still use blue for an occasional playbill, although usually it's titled showbill. Same company, but it designates productions off-Broadway, so we occasionally see that there. From that art, we move to photographic art. Photographic art started not with photographs, but with portraits of major artists. And a man, uh, Louis Lupas, was very, very influential during the 40s, during the 50s, and created works of Paul Robeson, of Lunton Fontaine, of Maurice Evans. And we find those works continuing to exist today. But fairly quickly, we move into photographs of leading ladies, leading men, simply because audiences go to see the stars. They don't go to see the production. They go to see Danny Kay in. They go to see Gertrude Lawrence in. And we see those stars on the covers. And they come about late in the 30s, but more so in the 40s and on to today, really. So there are a number of examples of early 40s and 50s covers as we go through. As we moved to the star, there was an also an attempt to show audiences the production that they were about to see, or in cases of having seen the production, the sh uh, a reminder of what they had seen. So uh, covers began to have production photos from productions themselves. And some of the covers that, that are exhibited here give us a, a good example of, of what it was like to attend the theater at that time. So those artworks grace the cover as well. We discover, however, that the artists didn't want to just take a photo. They wanted to manipulate photos and work with photos and create artwork from photos. So we begin the montage. The montage could simply be one company, usually the group theater, that would put together their entire season in a collection of art, or it might be a collection of photos from the production that put together to could become a cover, something like Kiss and Tell, something like Pal Joey, something like Best Foot Forward. Uh, my favorite of the montage pieces is the Empire Theater production of The Old Maid in 1935. It looks like a simple opening night at the theater with people waiting for the curtain to rise. But if you really look carefully, there are if memory serves, 107 different individual photographs put together, constructed to create this simple theater and this simple evening's entertainment. So there are lots and lots of individual photos that combine to create this theater and this opening neck. And then we have a few oddities, a few unique pieces. Uh, those might include the center theater, a uh, Kitty Carlisle piece from the 30s, Something like the Golden Playbill from Chu Chin Chow, a very unsuccessful production in New York, although a grand hit in London, and works by especially the Hippodrome Theatre. The Hippodrome Theatre was, for quite some time, the largest theatre in the world. 
uh, and was quite a bit larger than Radio City Music Hall today is. But the Hippodrome sought to make money not by merely providing programs, which they did in an inexpensive manner, produced by their own publishing company, Comstock and Guest, produced the playbills and produced many of the shows at the Hippodrome. But if you didn't happen to like that program and really wanted something to remember the show by, you could buy a souvenir program for five to ten cents. And souvenir programs came in many different styles. Some unrelated to the play used covers with zanies, the comic characters from Commedia dell'arte, from the improvised comedy of Italy of the 1500s, 1600s. Other productions used artwork specific to their show, so you would in fact see uh, the American Indian on a story of America. The Falls is a very famous Archie Gunn work that, uh, that is on the Hippodrome cover, and we'll see a variety of covers there too. So there are a great number of covers related specifically to the Hippodrome. And then finally, we thought we would put together a few pieces that were slightly different. The, the competition, what other people were selling. There, there are initial programs from the 1920s, from the New Theater, from Keith's Vaudeville, from the Manhattan Theater. There are some souvenir programs from Chu Chin Chow and the Garden of Allah. Uh, Max Reinhardt's The Miracle is also included. And then a more recent series of covers from Man and Superman with Maurice Evans. Ethel Barrymore in the White Oaks and pieces like that. There are a few postcards provided also. Playbill during the 1930s through the 19 early 50s often provided postcards to their patrons when they provided the playbill. And if you filled out the postcard while at the theater, having a great time, wish you were here, they would mail the postcard for you for free and take it up at the end of the evening. So that's the collection. It's a varied collection. It's a wonderful collection to literally come pick up, feel, and, and see what it's like to have dealt with some of these pieces.